have faith, family, and then football. We don't have to hate on the people that like the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers. We, we don't have to hate on the people. We can just hate on the team and we can care about the people right there because we have our priorities right. Faith, family, and then football. We use football to spend time with our family. We use football to create memories. We don't let football use us. We don't turn into a butthole when we, we, well, maybe we turn into a little bit of a butthole when we lose, but you know, give me 10, 20 minutes after the loss, go and be by myself, blow off some steams, maybe listen to a, a couple tool songs, get the anger out and then I'm okay. Right. But we don't have to worry about any of that yet. You know why? Because we're still in preseason. And you know what we do in preseason is we don't get too high and we don't get too low, right? So the Lions coming off of a victory in preseason, and I, and I understand that does something for you. I know that was overreaction Monday yesterday's poster, but that's what it is. 24, 23, we saw some things in that win that we liked. And I want to know what was your favorite part about the win? Who was the guy that stepped up? You know, who was the the guy that you wanted to watch the best part of the win? And what was the worst part? What was the worst part of the win? The thing that we were like, oh, God, I really wanted to see that. And we can hit that up. But we're going to talk about some of these roster battles today. Um, back to Reality Tuesday. Let's talk about it. Back to reality here. The, nothing that happened on Saturday is all of a sudden like make us more of a Super Bowl contender than we already are or anything like that. So let's 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 bring it back to reality, but let's really talk about some of these back end roster battles that are going on. And I I like going to the the sideline report. Those are some of our boys right there. Brad Berryman doing his weekly 53 man roster projections. And I just go through that and see where we're at with some of the stuff. As I get into the comments and say hello to everybody in here, let's sit, see what we got in here. Dwayne, good morning to Dwayne. Hello, Dwayne. It's good to see you, Dwayne. It is nice to see you on this Tuesday morning. Detroit fan man's up in the house. I had that chorus stuck in my head yesterday. I couldn't uh, remember where it came from. It's your opportunity. Don't miss your opportunity. And uh, and I love that. Sometimes you gotta get knocked down. Sometimes you got times you gotta lose to win. Hey, bear down, Mike says, "What up, guys? It's been a while. I, I figured you would be in here earlier, bear down, Mike. We we actually been you know pumping up your guy a little bit right there. Caleb Williams doing some pirouettes and throwing some dimes out there. He looks pretty good. He looks pretty good. Other than the fact that you know he went three and out." against the best defenses that he's faced three times in the two first two preseason games. He really, really does look good when he can get outside of the, 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 the platform and everything, but still trying to see if this guy can operate inside the pocket and, and play the game where 70% of the game is played, which is in the pocket, just making reads and doing things. Um, every play can't be an off platform thing. Bear down. What's up, bro. It's nice to have you in here. But uh, Fred Peterson, it's a great day to be a lion. Yes, Paul Jones in the house. And uh, Paul Jones is still in the house. Okay, I think I got – oh, wait, Davey. How, how did I get up there? How did I miss Davey? Henry Gray, good morning. Good morning to you. Hope you have your coffee. I don't do coffee. I'm the energy drink guy and the guy. I like these ghost guys. Um, The Sour Patch version. That's what I'm doing. Good morning, go Lions from uh, from uh, Maurice uh, Elise. Good morning, Russell. Good morning, Paul. Hello, villains. Great day to be a Lions fan. I wanted to put a shout out to you, Elise, the queen of memes, because you were so quick the minute that Mike busted out that Legatron. <laughs> you were on it. You were on it, making a piece of content, throwing it up there. So. That's the that's the nickname that was given to Jake Bates in the Jake Bates Motel Legatron the minute that he came in here. Because if you have a Megatron, it only seems like 
it's obvious that you would have a Legatron. Megatron and Legatron. And uh, if the Lions need that extra zero, I took so much heat from this. But I threw out uh, a, a post that asked if you thought that Calvin Johnson could still play. And uh, it's kind of a joke. I don't, I mean, I don't, I didn't want to put it out there to be any kind of seriousness. But if you think about it, Calvin Johnson, six foot six, 225 pounds. Like, we don't need you to run the routes all the way down the field anymore. You bring in Calvin Johnson, you know, he comes in and he's playing and he can come in only in the red zone. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and I, and I put a stat line in there, like if Calvin Johnson were to come back and pull Terrell Owens, you know, and he's 38 years old. All right. I could still play. We don't need you to run down to be the burner no more. We need you to run up into the end zone, red zone, jump up and catch that ball, Calvin Johnson. That's all we need. He's a big red zone target. And then I think that the offense is complete. Calvin Johnson, 15 catches, 150 yards, 15 touchdowns. <laughs> oh God, I know. That that see, that that's a. That's not back to reality Tuesday. I'm sorry. <laughs> Detroit fan man. I was very excited to, to see Levi play. Still waiting. You So let's talk about that. Detroit fan man. Levi Onzerike did not play. So when I'm looking at this preseason game, everybody wants to say, oh, wow. Hendon Hooker. He, he he was he was 12 for 15. He looks like the real deal. It's like, I can pump the brakes on that. I can definitely pump the brakes on Hendon Hooker because he did it against the second strings. Anything that happened in that game is just, I mean, the players that played are fighting for roster spots. But what did that tell us? What did that tell us by not seeing Levi Onzerike play? Like, who wasn't out there told me more about our roster than who was out there. Because Levi not being out there means they have confidence in him, that they don't need to see him play. He doesn't need to get reps to see if he's going to make this team. Aleem McNeil didn't play because he doesn't need reps out there to make this team. Kyle Pecco, he doesn't need reps to go out there and make this team. So who wasn't out there told me more about this roster than who was out there. What do you think about that thought? Um, I think Levi Onzerike is a sleeping beast. And, and not because I was watching tape. And this is what I saw about his bend. Nothing like that. I believe Dan Campbell when he talks. I'm one of those people. And I'm not blindly believe. I'm not just like, yeah, whatever Dan Campbell says, I'm just going to run off and bite a kneecap. He tells me, but I'm not there. But he doesn't blow smoke. I mean, can you show me any examples of where Dan Campbell's blown smoke? I can't. I don't I, I don't think I've seen too many versions of that. So when Dan Campbell says that Levi Onzerike is the best defensive lineman out there in training camp, I believe him. And and I don't believe him in a homeristic way. I just believe him because he didn't need to say that and he doesn't have to say that. And there's nothing good to gain out of just saying that to say it. You know, oh wow. Like I mean, last year he didn't pull any punches. It was one of those guys. I believe I was one of those guys that was at the back end of the roster. You know, we shoot. We were happy that he could even get out there. I think we they were surprised that his back didn't end his career. So when I talk about Levi Onzerike, I'm very excited to see him play. And I think that you're going to see him play in week one. And judging by the way that they're seeing him in practice, that this guy looks like the second round pick that they drafted in 2021. I mean, you could even see 
the progressions a little bit from last year when you look at Levi Onzerike. He's one of the guys that I like to, to bring up in uh, the, the PFF grades just because, you know, I was surprised when I looked at his grades from last year because I didn't, for one, I didn't think he played all that much, and he really didn't. But um, he didn't have a, a a ton of plays last year. He only played out there the total snaps, uh, da, 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 uh, about 120 snaps last year. And out of the 120 snaps that he had, he had a 68.1 overall grade. Uh, and he had a pass rush of 70.6. Now, I'm not going to get overjoyed about that, but – that that score takes me to a place where like he showed some things last year, right? And that 120, that small sample size, that's he he played well in the small sample size that he had last year. So it doesn't surprise me that he went into an off-season regimen. He puts on 20 pounds. He's over he was a 290 pound defensive tackle last year. Now he's 305. You know, he's he they, they, they say he put almost 20 pounds of just muscle on the back, and he's holding it well on his back. That was the question for three years with Levi Onzerike. Two back surgeries. He never really got out there. You know, last year was just kind of like, it, it reminded me of like a first year after an ACL injury where you're like, okay, they, they usually it takes a couple of years to get the confidence back. So last year... He had to have the confidence that the muscle and the and and the things that he was doing could hold the weight. Can his back hold the weight? Now that your back can hold the weight, can you still do the twitch and and, and play the game at a high level? So so far he's holding out, holding up good, so well that I think that he's going to be one of the starting rotation guys, especially if, uh, Broderick Martin ends up missing the first few games rehabbing that quad. So that's my take on that, Detroit fan man. I hope that you enjoyed that. I don't know. Russ, who do you believe in? Uh, who will be our CB1? Now, Fred, I do believe that's going to be Carlton Davis the third. They spent a third-round pick on him. The guy has won a Super Bowl playing cornerback. Um, if you ask around the league to the players, don't talk to the uh, PFF guys. But if you talk to the players, he's one of the best man corners in the league when he's playing man. Now, don't ask him to drop back into zone coverage much. And I think that you're going to be fine having Carlton Davis as the CB1. And this Lions defense is going to be much different than last year just in the way that they can attack now. Like, they got through the first half of last year, and they admittedly said this. They did not have the personnel to run the type of defense that Aaron Glenn wants to write, to, to, to run. Like, they want to be really, really aggressive with this defense. Now, the problem with being aggressive is you leave your cornerbacks on an island. And that's not the worst thing in the world, unless you don't have good cornerbacks. <laughs> So you have to have good man cornerbacks. I don't even think that we had – Kendall Vildor is probably the best man cornerback that we had, but he doesn't have the speed to hang with number one wide receivers. Put Kendall Vildor out in the slot, yeah, he can cover a big he, – he can play physical right there. But Carlton Davis – Carlton Davis was the answer kryptonite to, like, a DK Metcalf, right? We didn't have the big physical cornerback that could match up against big X receivers. And I don't know if you noticed, but big X physical receivers seemed to own us last year. You know, DK Metcalf had his way with our secondary. He did whatever he wanted to. But now you got a couple guys like Rake Straw is that kind of guy, a big physical guy that can handle X receivers. Terry on Arnold, I think, is kind of locked in at that number one, number two slot right there first round pick doing everything that he can do in camp so i do believe it's carlton davison fred okay davison 
Carlton Davis the third will be the number one cornerback. Terry Arnold will probably win the number two spot, but we don't know. We haven't seen these guys play because that's what we want to do in preseason is look at the guys that are in roster battles. So I hope that answers your question. Worst part about the game was DPJ is a huge letdown and, uh, he had had huge hopes for him, but Williams is showing up. So is that really a bad thing? Think about that, Paul. Like, if Isaiah Williams beats out DPJ, are you really all that hurt about it? I mean, what, what do we really want to see? We want to see our young players that are on rookie contracts. We got Isaiah Williams to give them a four-year deal, you know? Undrafted free agent rookie deal. They signed him into a little signing bonus too. And if Isaiah Williams comes in and wins that number three, number four spot in the wide receiver, that's the answer to that problem. And and he looks different. Like all the other wide receivers, they, they, Dan Campbell asked for a wide receiver to step up. I think it's Isaiah Williams. Isaiah Williams looked like a man amongst boys in the second half. And then when he was out there in the first half with our twos versus their number one defense, he looked like he belonged. He's making catches, making plays, um, plus plays against the starters. And then when he gets out there versus the number twos and the number threes, he looked like a man amongst boys. I'm sorry. Second half. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get too high on the guys in the second half because you know, some of those guys might be going back to their factory jobs at the end of next week when they cut the rosters down to 53. And that's what Hendon Hooker was playing against. That's what they were playing against in the second half was the guys that might be going back to their jobs at the end of next week. But in the first half, they were playing against Kansas City starters. And Isaiah Williams showed up in a big way. And let's get into this roster stuff right here. We're we're talking about this roster stuff, and uh, and I got some uh, Brad Berryman from the sideline report. Uh, Fifty three man roster projections. Um, starting with the quarterback. Let's start with the quarterback. I think that's pretty obvious. I think that Hendon Hooker did enough to win that backup job already. He's better than Hendon Hooker. Slide. If you saw that he slide. He, he had that slide. It's good. All right. It was nice to see you slide. He went 0 for 2. Hendon Hooker goes 0 for 2 in the in the first series. And then he finished the game 11 for 12. Like, the, the, he, he was spot. I mean, if I had to critique anything on Hendon Hooker, it's just like slow down the passes, right? He kind of reminded me of uh, – Matt Stafford when he first got here. Like it took Matt Stafford a couple years to learn touch, right? Like when you're throwing screen passes, you don't need to throw that thing in there at 900 miles an hour. I mean, breaking people's fingers and uh Hooker had a little bit of that. He just needs to get a little bit more touch on his ball, but he was accurate in that game. Uh, he's got to start out too. You can't you can't go three out three and out on every one of your first drives. That's the other thing. But the cool thing is, is the second third day go, going eleven for twelve. You can't ask the guy to do anything more than that. Um, you 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 could ask for better competition. I would have really liked to see him in the first half. I wanted to see him against the starters, but I believe that Hendon Hooker is developing, and this is the slow game. Everybody wants a – this is a right-now world, right? So everyone's like, oh, what are we going to do with Hooker? We signed re -sign Goff. What are we going to do with Hooker? We're going to continue to develop him. He's on a four-year deal. He's going to be here to 2026. So he's here to develop as the backup quarterback right now. Uh, Green Bay uses the same type of thing. You know, we're going to develop this quarterback. He's going to – right now he's at a spot where I think that he can slide in as a backup. Uh, if he continues to develop, he could get into, you know, starter level talent. And I think that's the plan. I'm like, I don't want to, you know, like th this is, 
the, the obvious answer sometimes is the obvious answer. Oh, what are we going to do with Hooker? Got to keep developing him. He's the backup quarterback. You know, from game one to game two, he's developed. You could see that he's developed, getting developed. Still lots of mistakes that are out there, but he's a backup. We're not expecting him to come out and take meaningful snaps unless Jared Goff gets injured. In which case, with his athleticism and the fact that it looks like he he understands the offense, he knew where the reads were and everything, and can throw complete, uh, accurate passes, I think that Hendon Hooker is developing into a guy that could possibly come in if Jared Goff goes down and maybe win a game or win a series. Come in and, and spell. Like, did you feel the same way with Nate Sudfield? No. No. He was carrying Goff's bags. Carrying his groceries. Watching film with him. No, don't, but don't put Sudfield out there. Holy crap. In a meaningful snap? No. Do I believe that Hendon Hooker can take meaningful snaps? Yes. I think he could take meaningful snaps. I don't want him starting for the whole year yet. But as of right now, through the progression, whatever he learned last year, the Teddy Bridgewater stuff in the offseason, he looks better. And he looks like he could be a backup. I'm glad that we don't have to decide whether to make him a starter or not. Like those Bear fans. I mean, the Bear fans, I love you got your quarterback, but I mean, you you gotta have a, have a backup. It looks like Bajan's pretty good. I guess I won't I won't go there on that. He's looking pretty good in that. But you're depending on your young quarterback to be the starter, which is okay. You spent the number one overall pick. You want that guy to be the starter. Well, we don't have to do that with Hooker. Even if Hooker was good enough to start, he probably wouldn't start because we got Jared Goff and Jared Goff. In this offense, there's no one that can run this Lions offense better than Jared Goff. It's like, it's the Goffense. <laughs> he helped design the offense. Who's going to run it better than the architect, <laughs> you know, with Panay Sewell blocking for you? Paul Jones says, at least ne Memes needs to meme uh, a meme of Bates with a, a, a cinder block as a foot. Uh, she made a great meme yesterday. For uh, Legatron, Legatron, the weapon. But uh, I, I love that. I love that. Uh, at least coming in there with that. So uh, starting quarterback, Jared Goff, backup quarterback, Hendon Hooker. So that's, I don't think they're going to keep three quarterbacks. If Nate Sudfield could stick around as a third quarterback and run the practice squad, I don't care. Really? You could do that. But. We're moving on. Running backs. Running backs. Let's see. Who are we going to keep as running backs? I don't think that there's too many surprises on here. Brad Berryman has four running backs on here. Obviously, David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs, Sion Baki, and Craig Reynolds. End of list. Four running backs. I have the same thing on my list. Four running backs. Those four guys. I... He has Sion Vaki as the third running back. I don't think that that's the case at all. I think people undersell our other running backs just because Jameer Gibbs is so electrifying and uh, everybody's expecting the giant breakout year out of Jameer Gibbs. And I don't mind that. I don't mind being in that headspace. It's okay. But um, David Montgomery is going to get his. And, you know, Prove me wrong, but I think that the Lions have the two top running backs in the North. And really, I don't have a burden of proof. <laughs> uh, if you want to if you want to try to prove to me why De DeAndre Swift is better than David Montgomery, you have the burden of proof. David Montgomery averaged more yards per carry, more yards after contact, more explosive runs. He had more yards. He had more touchdowns than anybody else. In the North. As a matter of fact, I can make an argument that David Montgomery is a better running back than Jameer Gibbs for this team right now. Um, but it's close where their production met. I mean, the fact that he had over a thousand yards in an offense that had Jameer Gibbs, who almost had a thousand yards himself. 
Um, and then Craig Reynolds is, I mean, come on, Craig, Craig, Craig is a stalwart. You can count on you. No block, no rock, right? That dude can block. Ask Carlton Davison the third. Davison. I keep saying Davison. Dang it. Carlton Davis the third. Ask Carlton Davis the third about how well Craig Reynolds can block. And to me, that's the only problem I have with this list. Not all the guys are there, but Craig Reynolds is the third running back. And Sion Vaki. What more can he say? You you got yourself a player right there. I mean, he he's going to be the fourth running back on this team. But I actually think they're going to put plays in for him because that boy with the 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 moves. He's I mean, he didn't even play running back. You know, he played a handful of games for Utah, but he was a safety. Um, I think they drafted him in the fourth round for special teams. And they wanted to see what they could get out of him at running back. And Sion Baki, Brad Holmes had him very, very high on the football intelligence list. Like he said, um, Dan Campbell had said that he gave him some homework at the senior bowl. And when they came in for the draft interview, he – he had everything. He remembered every single thing, almost like a photographic memory. He drew up the plays that they talked about at the Senior Bowl, and he provided him with the work that he did to fix the things that he asked him to fix the Senior Bowl. So he drafted this guy due to his football intelligence. You know, and obviously the tape, but every every guy in the draft is talented. But, you know, it's the football intelligence what got this guy drafted in the fourth round here. Um, he comes in right off the bat. You knew he was going to be a starter in special teams. And that's the type of player he was. So you got that. He learned that really, really fast. And they've been teaching him how to play running back. And he isn't there yet on the running back. And that's why Craig Reynolds is probably going to, be the third running back ahead of him. But, you know, you got a rookie player here. You got a rookie player that's going to be a contributor on special teams for sure in Sion Baki. And he's going to be a fourth running back. If one of those running backs goes down, he's going to be, slip right into that third spot. And then he's our, he, he could get some meaningful snaps this year at running back. And I do believe that after he learns the running back position, that they will cross train him at safety too, so he can spell safety and be the fifth or sixth safety in an emergency situation. So Sion Vaki is kind of like if you watch the Detroit Tigers back in the day, Don Kelly, baby. Don Kelly. You could play all the positions. You can count on him here, 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 and here. And versatile players. That 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 seems to be what Brad Holmes really loves to bring in here. The guys that uh, Dan Campbell really likes. Guys that can play different positions. Uh, Paul Jones says Williams looks like a pro. That's the, and I really saw that. I really did see that. And that's the end of the running back list. And I might as well get into the wide receivers right now while we're talking about it. Williams looks the part. So sideline report here, Brad Barryman. We're, we're kind of going through these roster battles right here. And wide receivers, he has them keeping five wide receivers. Amon Rossain Brown, Jamison Williams, Khalif Raymond, Isaiah Williams, and Donovan Peoples-Jones. And uh, I don't mind that list. I'm not going to push back too hard. Um, I think that, that Isaiah Williams played well in this last preseason game to earn him a spot on this roster. I think he locked himself up as the number four wide receiver on this team. Um, Donovan Peoples-Jones might get the number four wide receiver because he's kind of the only guy that does what he does, you know, that big, the big X. But I think they want playmakers more than anything else. 
I think some of our tight ends can go up and be the big X type of receivers. We'll get to that in a minute. But Williams definitely looked like a pro. I don't, I can't see him not on the roster, especially if he has another game. If he has another game. But then again, Tom Kennedy. Tom Kennedy is one of those guys that seems to play well every preseason. Shout out Tom Kennedy. But, um, but can't make the roster. So I don't know. I don't know. Isaiah Williams definitely looks like more of a look. He looks the pro where Tom Kennedy looks like a guy that tried so hard that you, you, you just couldn't deny him. And he, and the work is there and all this stuff. But Isaiah Williams is a different beast. I think that he's, he's got like the, the playmaking ability. He's got the, the, the it stuff. Um, Jonathan said, what up to the fams? Joseph in the house. Andre Ware would rifle that ball on guys on a screen pass. Yes, that definitely remind me of Andre Ware a little bit. Sudfield should not be in a Lions jersey. I got to defend Sudfield a little bit right there. I just don't want him playing in any meaningful games. But as far as preparation, Jared Goff loves this guy in the film room. A second set of eyes. He's really smart. Just don't want him throwing the ball. <laughs> Please just don't throw the ball. Hey, my Lions brother, Williams. Uh, let's see. Swift couldn't make it as a Lion. Oh, gosh, you guys are in there trash talking today. I think that Gibbs has a chance. <laughs> You, you think that, that that Gibbs kid has a chance to make the team? Oh, yeah. Hey, you think he might make it? He might. Uh, Joseph says that Monty, oh, uh, wait, Monty always wins at the end of the play. Falls forward. Uh, respected him as a bear. Glad he is a lion. Yeah, I the, the, the disrespect this offseason, and it really isn't. Montgomery's fault, right? You know, you, you want to give the other teams and their starting guys, you know, you, we, we want to try to respect those teams, you know. Well, Swift is the running, the, the starting running back, you know, and he's coming over and it's like Montgomery had, had a better season than Jameer Gibbs said. So it's like, Gibbs is known as our starting running back. That's what people are out there. That's what people are drafting in fantasy. And by the way, if you want a fantasy sleeper, just take David Montgomery four rounds later in your fantasy draft than you do Jameer Gibbs. And guess what? You're probably going to get near the same production. It's just like David Montgomery is just going to put that, that, that production up. And I love how our team is stacked at, at that running back position because, you know, Montgomery's contract is going to come up. Uh, I, I don't know if it's at the end of this year or the end of next year, but Sion Vaki is the next the, the next man up. He's training to be the David Montgomery. I don't think that they're going to re-sign David Montgomery to an extension. No offense to David Montgomery, but the game is played in in the in the pockets of the prime right and and if we're drafting and developing you know you got to go from a position of where you're spending six seven million dollars at a position you can save on it by having gibbs and vaki take over and i'm not talking this year i'm talking you know one or two years from now the uh what, what do you call it the fluid salary cap thing is it, you're really starting to see the long term of some of these things, but I like that list that wide receiver. I think Caden Davis has a, has a chance to get in there over uh, Donovan Peoples Jones, but I don't know if they want to have two inexperienced people on this roster because there's so many other positions we're going to, as we get into this uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about um, as we move on to tight ends. Tight ends. So the Lions are loaded at tight ends. It sucks because we're going to have to get rid of somebody that's that, that I like no matter what, unless they keep five tight ends. 
and I don't think they're going to do that. So obviously you've got Sam Laporta and Brock Wright um, as your one and two. That's as solid as any one and two tight ends in the in, in football. Um, love those two. And then uh, they have Shane Zilstra and James Mitchell. And uh, M- Zilstra feels like the lock as the third tight end right there because he's he's more of a uh like a receiving tight end and he's the guy I think that can satisfy that X receiver position that the Lions miss and that that we all talk about how oh, what are we going to do about the back end of this roster with the wide receivers oh they don't have depth of wide receiver, but they have depth of tight end and Shane Zostra can go up and catch the ball and contest it. And he's tall. You know, he's the Jimmy, he's our Jimmy Graham. He's got, I mean, he can go up. He's just going to be in there in, in the red zone. Cause you got, you got your yak guys, Brock Wright and Sam Laporta will handle most of the duties, but in the, in the red zone, Shane Zostra can come in and, and, and do the red zone catching. Now, James Mitchell, that's a fourth round pick. And I know, that Brad Holmes has very little misses when it comes out there. But I actually think that Parker Hess is going to win that, that, that fourth, that fourth job over James Mitchell. I think he offers more than James Mitchell. If James Mitchell could offer something different than Zilstra does. Um, I, I don't know. James Mitchell had a couple good catches in the last game, so that might, I mean, recency bias might put put him there. But Parker Hess has, like, fullback in him. Like, he he can block. He's straightly a straight, uh, uh, just like a blocking type of tight end, and he's really good at it. And he's been turning the heads from the blocking ability. It's like you didn't hear nothing about Parker Hess during OTAs, but that's because the pads weren't on. The minute the pads came on, all of a sudden, Brad Holmes was talking about Parker Hess being like, this guy's out there is destroying people out on the, the perimeter. And you need a good blocking tight end. There's some of the running package. I would love to see three tight ends out there and get block, Brock Wright, um, Sam Laporta, and and um, and this Parker Hesse out there. That would be, uh, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. So I think Parker Hesse has a – I got him in there over James Mitchell, but I do have four tight ends. So I have Sam Laporta, Brock Wright, Shane Zostra, and Parker Hesse as the four tight ends in there. What do you guys think of the tight ends? See if we got anybody in here even in here talking about the tight ends. Right. Let's see. We've got Sudfield. I'm in. Detroit Fan Man says – I'm in it to see Amon Ra and the boy Gibbs. Uh, he wants getting that 1,000, 1,000. Amon Ra St. Brown told Jameer Gibbs that he would buy him anything that he wants if he gets 1,000 yards receiving. And uh, and Gibbs said he was up for that challenge. I I... <laughs> This is where let, let, let me get the pump the brakes. This is like the the, the Tuesday. What would I call this? Back to reality Tuesday right here. There's one ball, guys. And and I know that there's a lot of hype with you know Amon Ra. He just got the big bag, right? He's gonna have a thousand yards, right? Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs is gonna have a thousand yards, right? Oh, wow. Look out for Jamison Williams. Jamison Williams is going to have a thousand yards. Oh, right. well, look out for Sam Laporta. Well, Sam Laporta is going to have a thousand yards. Everybody gets a thousand yards. We're going to give thousand yards out like Oprah. You can, everybody can have a thousand yards. Let's give a thousand yards to everybody. And, uh, and the reality comes back and Jared Goff is going to throw for 12,400 yards this year, according to all of our lion faithful. <laughs> And I don't mind, you know, somebody's going to get the thousand yards, right? And, you know, are are all these guys going to be able to get a thousand yards? No. Uh, Is it going to look like regression? Somebody's going to have regression somewhere. I mean, would it hurt your feelings if 
Amon Ra only caught 103 balls and only had 1,100 yards instead of 1,500. Maybe he has two more touchdowns than he did last year. Is it really going to hurt your feelings to have Jamison Williams only have, you know, 800 yards receiving? With eight touchdowns, is that going to hurt your feelings? The same Laporta only gets 750 yards as a tight end. Is that really going to hurt your feelings? Because that's probably where it's going to really be. Everybody isn't getting a thousand. I mean, there's a lot of mouths to feed, but the good thing is, is you have a good distributor. I think Jared Goff is the best distributor in the league, but he has to be protected. The caveat to that, he doesn't have any mobility like Caleb Williams or uh, Jordan Love. They they can do the off-platform stuff. Those guys win the 30% of the game where shit breaks down, right? But we've built a team where shit doesn't break down as much. So the 70% of the game, which I think it's probably more like 85% of the game for us, is... Jared Goff playing from a clean pocket and making decisions and distributing the football. And that's what he's the best at. He can distribute the ball. Let's get into these offensive linemen. Speaking of the best offensive linemen in football. Um, the depth has been stepping up. Because they haven't been working, working anything. They struggled a little bit in the first half against the Kansas City Chief, but they still kept Sudfield pretty clean in that even against the starters. So obviously we know Panay Sewell, right tackle, Taylor Decker, left tackle, Frank Ragnow, center, Kevin Zeitler, guard one, Glasgow, guard two. Um, Colby Sorsdahl is, is, is a quality depth piece. He can actually play tackle or guard on either side and relief. Dan Skipper has been here for the last three years. He's a solid depth piece. Uh, Coyote Awasika. Uh, and they have Christian Mahogany in here. I think that there's a couple of other linemen. Let me see if they have them in here. Yeah, they saw Kingsley. Like Kingsley and uh, there was one other, there was one other guy that played that, that, that played well. But, but we're really talking about the back end of this roster. Uh, they got Giovanni Manu making the team. And I think that what will happen to him is he'll he'll make the team and then they're going to put him on the practice squad. They'll do the same thing with him that they did with Broderick Martin. So one of these other guys, all these guys I think are going to make. I like this list of people right here. You got the starters and then you add Colby Source, all Dan Skipper, Giovanni Manu, K. Awasika, uh, and sixth round draft pick Christian Mahogany. All those guys would make it, in, in my opinion. And Giovanni Manu and Christian Mahogany may move down to the practice squad, and a couple of the other younger guys may end up coming up to the roster, or they may do a a swap with a different position. As we get to the defensive side, I think that it'll make a lot more sense because when it comes to the back end of the roster, it it isn't about, hey, I need to win the linebacker job or the defensive tackle job. You may be in competition with a defensive tackle if you're a wide receiver because you're talking about the back end of the roster and we're looking for talent. We're looking for talent and depth. and uh, if we get deeper at one position because that guy has a more talented, they have more talented people in there. And I think that we may run into that with a lot of these guys on the defensive line that have been showing out. So defensive linemen, they have them all listed here. I wish that they broke them up and pass rushers. and But we'll just go ahead and name all these guys off right here. They got obviously got Aiden Hutchinson, Aline McNeil, Marcus Davenport, uh, DJ Reader, Levi Anzarike. Uh, Josh Pascal, Broderick Martin, Makai Wingo, Kyle Pecco. No uh, surprises right there. Um, there's a couple of guys that might be able to sneak in here. Because when I'm looking at this list, I don't I don't see any ho holes right there. J DJ Reader might not be available if they put him on 
the short-term IR and he misses the first couple games, that might happen, which will give Levi Onzerike his starting spot. But he, from from what has been said, that him and Josh Pascal have been having a, a, an amazing camp. They've been playing well, and those guys make plays in, in camp. And Josh Pascal made a pretty big play in the – in the uh, Kansas city game, Broderick Martin looks good too. Broderick Martin's put together a really, really nice camp came in last way. Makai Wingo. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a six round draft pick that shouldn't have been a six round draft pick. So I love the defensive line right here. I love all these guys. I absolutely see why they didn't go out into free agency and spend a lot of money. I mean, what, what are you doing? By not spending money. Well, you're believing in Levi Onzerike. You're believing in Josh Pascal. And you're believing in uh, Broderick Martin. Um, you're, you're bringing in Marcus Davenport. And he's been injured most of the time. But he hasn't been injured at all. He looks fully healthy in this, this camp. We'll see how many games we can actually get out of him. Because when he does play, he plays well. His problem hasn't been the way he plays. His problem has been when he hasn't played, which is a lot. So Levi owns Arike. God, we, I'm, I'm probably the most excited about him on that defensive line. Let's see if we got any defensive line uh, comments in here. Let's see what we got. Who's still? Oh, there's Broski Bear. I can't wait to see there. Let me get, let me, I have to go up a little bit, Broski, before I get to your comment. Joseph says, Monty always wins at the end of the play, falls. Okay, I already said that one. I'm sorry. I, I got to go find where I was. Da, 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 da. Lions have a balanced offense uh, uh, that is tight and friendly. Half of Laporta's TD are because he's wide open. Russell could have scored. I know. Yeah, you know what? And I would have done a touchdown dance too, Joseph. I have my touchdown dance down just in case I ever catch a touchdown pass from uh, Jared Goff. <laughs> uh, Moore, Martin, and Perryman had a thousand yards in the same season. That's that's a good point. But you know, we're gonna throw in a. Uh, uh, a tight end and a running back in there. There's 5,000 yards. <laughs> hey, you know what? I mean, the, the, the production's going to, there's one ball and the production's going to come from somewhere. I believe in the way that Goff distributes the ball and him having more shiny weapons is just going to make him even better. So Lions tight ends are solid. Obviously Laporta, but everyone else below him are very good. Hell, uh, we kept Brock Wright, kept him from going from another team. Yeah, Brock Wright is one of those dudes you can't you can't let your lunch pail guys go. And every team has lunch pail guys. And Brock Brock Wright was here the very first year as an undrafted free agent, and he just worked his way onto the team, man. Like he's every every, every team has a couple of players that. Only the real hardcore fan base guys really know about, and you like them, right? You got these the, the lunch pail guys. And I know Broski's got one too. Such lofty predictions uh, uh, for Lions players and 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 the team over all the system. Uh, what do you mean lofty pr predictions? I'm joking. I don't think you think I do you really think I b believe that Jared Goff's going to throw for 9000 yards? <laughs> oh gosh, I'm a homer. I am a homer, broski, but I don't think I'm that much of a homer. <laughs> uh the 49ers uh at that. Yeah. You can't let them go to the 49ers. Uh Wright had 47 uh, receptions in 3 seasons. Bears second string Gerald Everett has 51 receptions this last season Brock Wright is not that guy do you do you know what Brock Wright has Brock, Brock Wright has uh uh enough of run blocking springs for touchdowns when he's out there in two tight end sets you you don't need your tight ends to I mean you're measuring this off of receptions 
Wow. Well, well, I mean, you you don't know what you don't know. I mean, if you just if you you if you don't watch the games and you just throw uh, stats out there, and that's not going to be. I mean, because I can do the same thing. Hey, Caleb Williams went three and out his first two possessions. He was six for thirteen. He ain't that good. See, I can do that too, but I'm realistic to watching Caleb Williams. I watch him play. I've watched Brock Wright play. I watch him play on play on my team as the second tight end, and he does the dirty work. And instead of running down my players, broski, what I want is for you to tell me who your lunch pail guy is. Who's a guy on your team that works really, really hard and maybe gets underappreciated that just can't find his way off of your team. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about Brock Wright. You could say he's that, but, but he's as good as any one of your backup tight ends, 400-year-old four, Mercedes Lewis. I, I, I'm sorry. Colton, Cole Komet is a very good tight end. I'll give you that. That's nice tight end. That's as good as a... To me, you can put him up against any of the tight ends out there that are just, you know, Joe Schmo tight ends. You know, the tight ends are so hard to gauge. You know, when you're looking at like fantasy football and stuff like that, you're 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 trying to if you're trying to gauge, you know, tight ends off of receptions, you can't really do it because what do you have? You got the top end guys. You know, you got five, six guys in the NFL that have like, you know, those elite, maybe even wide receiver type of numbers. But then like number six through 20 are like the same dude. They're all like that. Couple catches, you know, those receptions. Like you're throwing at me saying, uh, you know, Wright had 40, 48 receptions in, in, in three seasons. Bears second string. To, Jared Abbott had 51 receptions just last season. Like receptions. Like, okay. They're that, sometimes you, you, it's not the number one focus of your team. Your team didn't have Amon Ross St. Brown, Sam Laporta eating up all the targets last year. And Jameer Gibbs and running the football more. Like, Run, we, we run different teams. Davenport, you don't have to do all that work on. He's going to get help in Minnesota when he had to do all the work. What is that? that Davenport, you don't have to do. Okay. you Davenport, you don't have to do all the work now. He's got help in Minnesota. He had to do all the work. I don't agree with that. Davenport just got injured in Minnesota. And Davenport had Daniel Hunter on the other side. Davenport didn't have any excuses last year other than the fact that he got injured. But definitely not saying Daniel Hunter is a beast. Daniel Hunter is just as good as Hutchinson. <laughs> Maybe not this year. As long as we whip the Cowboys, those are one of that's one of the revenge games. He was still uh, he was stiff in college, no mobility. Oh, she's nice. Uh, I know Brock Wright is, is not that guy, but the Lions fans are saying how deep they are at tight end. My point is the Lions have one legit tight end as a weapon. Okay. We have one receiving threat weapon. Uh, Shane Zilstra is a receiving threat weapon, but he is a, a red zone target. So no, you're not going to see him go out and get 46 receptions, but what you will see is Shane Zilstra have 12 catches this year and five of them or six of them might go for touchdowns. That's what type of player he is. Like you guys are running offenses that have two tight end sets, right? You guys are running out to do pass plays with your tight ends more. Yes, Sam Laporta is the only receiving threat tight end that we have, but uh, tight end isn't just receiving. As a matter of fact, a good tight end receiving is actually the secondary thing that the tight ends do. Gosh, I get to educate on football, how to how to play the game of football. Wow. Lions offense set 
tight end records after they traded for Hawk. Yeah, yeah. He he ain't counting that one. Uh, I guess one of the 43 receptions was an 87-yard touchdown that you're talking about with Brock Wright. Um, Joseph, uh, okay, you guys are talking with each other now. Okay. It's a lazy take by all, all you tight end, all your, okay, okay. Okay, so here we go. I'm just going to generalize Broski. Broski thinks all of our tight ends suck other than Laporta. So all of this, we're not trying to overtout our guys. I am doing a 53-man roster prediction. When I mentioned these tight ends, I am mentioning four tight ends that are on our team that are going to make the roster. I am not saying that these are the greatest tight ends in the world, but all four of those tight ends are quality tight ends to do what you need tight ends to do. Block on the perimeters, the the things they can catch the ball. They don't drop the ball. Like I'm not, I'm not, and and I didn't say anything about Mercedes Lewis until you mentioned Mercedes Lewis. This is not a a a, a dick contest between the the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears on our show here. God, every time I mention a guy on my team, I get I, I get called out for over touting the guy. Here, I'm going to do linebackers. I'm getting ready for the the broski on how all of our linebackers suck. All right, Alex Anzalone. Uh, this is what sideline report has here has five have us keeping five linebackers, and I actually like this list. Uh, Alex Anzalone, Jack Campbell, Derek Barnes, Jalen Reeves, Maben, and Malcolm Rodriguez. And right there, and there's another guy that I actually have. Oh, shoot, I forgot to say goodbye to everybody from the huddle. Well, the ones that just come over after the huddle broadcast is done, um, welcome. The ones that are that we're watching on NFC North, the huddle. Hold on a second. Let me uh, get this little graphic graphic up here. I got lost. There for a second. Right there. NFL, the huddle on Roku. We're on Roku. We were on Roku. We're not on there right now. But welcome over. We got people coming over. We got the the Lions Villain Squad. Thank you to everybody that is watching the program on the Lions Villain Squad right now. Please go over and follow and like, share, do something. If you're watching the program right now, Reach down, hit that like button. That helps us out, and it's free for you. You don't have to do any. It, 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 we're not begging for money. We ain't doing any of that stuff. You can give us money if you want. We got a Patreon. Uh, JC Sports and the Lions Villain Squad YouTube page. Thank you for subscribing, and most of all, thank you for joining the conversation. As much as I like to argue with Broski, I, I like Broski in here because he can give me inside information on what the what the Bears are doing. And you haven't answered my question, bro. Who's your guy? Who's your lunch pail guy? Did you did you did you give me a guy and I didn't see it? Or were you just trashing my guys? Uh da, 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 da. No. So Broski's in here to talk trash today and that's it. He he, he ain't going to answer legitimate football questions for his own team. He's going to, he's going to trash on our guys. So Alex Anzalone, Jack Campbell, Derek Barnes, Jalen Reeves, Maven, Malcolm Rodriguez. That is solid. Uh, and Mitchell Agude to me is throwing his, his hat into the ring right here. Like, this is one of the guys that I was surprised. I, I hadn't seen him play. I had only heard Dan Campbell talk about him from practice squad. You know, when they were doing the practice, they kept on mentioning Mitchell Agude. It's like, here's this guy that just won't go away. Here's a guy that we weren't thinking about, but he keeps making us look at him. Um, And Mitchell Agude, he's like, I asked him to go make this play. And I was like, well, let's see what he can do. Let's see if he can make this play. And then he makes that play. And then they put him in the game against the Kansas City starters. And Mitch Lagude goes out there, gets a real nice tackle for a loss. He, I mean, he looked like he belonged. And he's a linebacker that can rush the passer. 
and I don't know where he could go. He's not on this list. I don't know. Let's see if they even mention him in here. A lingering injury for Rodriguez opens the door for Bill Neiman, possibly to make the roster as well as he did the Chiefs. There's, there's a lot of room. Neiman might make it. They didn't say anything there. Um, da, 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 da. James Houston being moved back to strictly edge rusher, but the knee injury from the first. Uh, Ogude. Okay, so Ogude, they're looking at as more of a pass rusher. Okay, here we go. It's odd that Pascal was in the game against the Chiefs so late, but he made a notable key play in a strip sack. Ogude is making a push toward the good side of the roster bubble, and he, uh, but he didn't quite make it here. Petco seems to be the insurance. So, according to sideline report, they're viewing him more as an edge rusher, and. I think that he might be able to make it onto the roster and maybe one of those tight ends, like uh, Broski was saying that isn't as good. That might make, uh, make rooms for R Mitchell Agude at a different position. But I, I, I really liked the way that he played. He looked fast. He looked like he was disruptive and he might be one of those outliers. Mitchell Agude, look for that name in there, but I love Alex Anzalone has done nothing but, overachieve you know you bring him in and i and i remember even saying man i i don't want to see him as the starter i want to see him coming off the bench in a couple of years but he just you know he just keeps taking the the room over he's one of the leaders in there and he keeps getting better and he's playing the best football of his career i love that alex anzalone jack campbell took over the middle linebacker job last year week 12 and it doesn't look like he's ever going to give it back that's our starting middle linebacker for the next 10 years right there. And, and he had a quiet, really, really good rookie season last year. And we're looking for the progression. Progression is the scariest thing on any team. Derek Barnes keeps getting better and better. Jalen Reeves Maben was a first team, all pro special teamers that offers value as a backup, linebacker and then Malcolm Rodriguez shoot he started 16 games in his rookie year he's still he's still repping he's still here so we got the band still together linebacker uh a weakness in 2021 is now a strength in 2023 so go figure oh what did you think of those let's see uh way to dodge the question blosive gosh man yeah hey broski you got I mean, we're not personally insulting in here I don't want you to do that it doesn't he doesn't want to tell you. It's Tyson Page. <laughs> oh, Joseph says Broski can be okay, but the ignorance keeps uh, it sometimes is telling. All right, seems like a good day uh, to believe in Mitchell. Uh, will you probably take a good day over Mitchell, huh? Just keep the three tight ends. Oh man, I don't know. I I really like Nice. I like Nice because he ain't going to catch passes. He's just a, a a brute that can play the fullback position in there. But as we get into the cornerbacks, I'm going a little bit over today because I want to make sure I got through all of these roster predictions where we're at right now and where these battles are. Cornerbacks, they have them keeping six cornerbacks. Uh, Carlton Davis III, Terion Arnold, Meek Robertson, Ennis Rakestraw, Kendall Vildor, and Khalil Dorsey. I hate the I hate seeing Kendall Vildor on there. But it's really a thing where I really just don't want to see Kendall Vildor as the starting cornerback. When you move when you chuck him down four spots on the depth chart, I don't mind seeing his name on the back end of the roster. I just don't want him starting. I like Khalil Dorsey in there. Um he, he's definitely outplayed uh, Stephen Gilmore. Uh, and, and I think that we can get some of these younger DBs that have been playing well to slip through. So I don't mind this one, I w but honestly, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if Kendall Vildor was off and uh, somebody like Strickland or one of these guys that is stepping up as a younger player slips in there on the cornerback version right there. But I don't mind that list. That ain't too bad. The cornerbacks. Vildor made a run at winning a roster spot lately. He's solidified by a good showing against the Chiefs. 
Dorsey equally solidified his roster spot. I think he really did. Dorsey looks like a plus player now after the third year in the system. Uh, injuries over the past week, uh, bringing opportunity. He's also seized into going into the game against uh, uh, Kansas City. So, yeah, I, no, no surprises right there. A couple of the young guys I'd like to see get in there. As safeties, ooh, here's a name that you're not used to seeing in safety. Brian Branch, Kirby Joseph, Ifatu Malafanu, Brandon Joseph, and C.J. Moore. We got guys that have been in the system. We're trusting the system guys, and uh, and I love seeing that. I love seeing that. Brian Branch is going to get unlocked this year because he played slot corner last year because we had no defensive backs. He didn't play slot corner because they wanted him to play slot corner. He played slot corner because our secondary was atrocious and we needed somebody to go in there. He's a safety. He's going to play better, especially in this system. And Aaron Glenn has said as much. The, the this, this defense is set up for the safeties to be able to be free and to roam and make plays. And Brian Branch is the most instinctive player that we have. So I believe moving him to safety, if one of those guys can step up and take that slot corner, and they they put Ifatu there. They've had a Meek Roberts in there. Rake Straw's been there. One of those guys takes over that job, then you're going to put Brian Branch in a position to make plays. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. That's that list is spot on. I mean, that basically all the safeties that have been here work. And CJ Moore was a great addition to that because he's such a good special teamer. Uh, Brandon Joseph's been in the system. Uh, since the beginning of last year. So he would just be getting the elevation to the main roster. And if you know about draft and develop, this is a win. That's a win when you get your guys moving from uh, the production into a production spot. Uh, Specialist Jake Legatron Bates. Jack, the best punter in the league still to this day. Jack Fox. We got, we got some legs out there. We got a pair of legs. We got a pair of booters. Long snapper Scott Daly, no surprises right here. And that is the Detroit Lions post week two roster predictions. So hope that you guys have uh, enjoyed that. Gosh. And it's 1113. I was only a little bit over. And that's cool. All right. We actually made good timing today. Love it. Love it. Thank you, everybody, for watching today. Thank you for being part of the program. Thank you for being part of the Back to Reality Tuesday. And this is the part where I know See, I got to talk a little bit about you, Broski, on this. Like, we brought everybody back to reality here. We we didn't go over homeristic. How many, how many teams in the NFL have two name tight ends? Tight ends in name is what I like to call them. Most tight ends are the dirty work guys. Why do you think they have so much of a hard time getting paid? Because they do the dirty work. It's the work that isn't seen. You know, defensive tackles. Defensive tackles have been getting paid as of late. But they do the dirty work. The real good ones do the dirty work. The defensive tackles that get all the sacks... I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, Aaron, Aaron Donald going in and getting the sacks. You need somebody that can 
play the run too. And he was the best at doing both. But most interior pass rushing defensive tackles aren't anchoring the way that they're supposed to. Like a really, really good defensive tackle will take a double team and position himself to take the double team to let some of the other players eat. And that's why they got DJ Reader. And that's why they're training Broderick Martin in the way that they're training him. I need you to eat people. Defensive tackle. That's why they don't get paid a lot. That's why the you can get a great defensive tackle in the late rounds. Because people value pass rushers. People value people that can protect quarterbacks from pass rushers. And they value quarterbacks. They value skill positions. Oh, I gotta have a good Aiden Hutchins. He, he needs a guy that's on the other side. No, he doesn't. He needs a guy that can eat people. Because Hutchinson has already proven that when you get him one on one, that more times than not, he's going to win. So you got a defensive tackle, a whole bunch of them that know how to eat people. It's not sexy. DJ Reader is not a sexy player. Broderick Martin is not a sexy player. Kyle Pecco is not a sexy player. But those three guys will eat people. Got to take two. They anchor themselves to take two. They train themselves to take two because that's what the good defensive tackles do. And that's why Terrell Williams may end up being the most significant signing of the Lions offseason. And I believe that because he makes that entire room better. All those young guys getting the best defensive line coaching. It's going to be good stuff, but valuable. Got to have value. Uh, Tight ends, they do more than catch the ball. So, No offense, Broski, but when you throw stats at me about how many receptions your tight ends have to fluff them up so you can have the illusion that you have better tight ends, you can do that. But that's you being a homer, not me. Because I know what a tight end is used for. And yeah, you do have to have a playmaking tight end. And we have the best one. We have the best playmaking tight end. Maybe in the NFL. You know, argue Kelsey, argue one of the older guys out there. But as a 23-year-old tight end, there's, there's no more promise in this league than Sam Laporta. So we have that guy. Your other tight ends? Faith, family, and football. That's the most important thing that we got here. I'm going to turn into a pumpkin if I don't get out of here. I'd love to sit here and talk with you guys all day. I really, this is one of the favorite parts of my day. And it's because, you know, not all life is grand. I smile a lot because I'm a happy person. But I'm usually a happy person no matter no matter what. I try to be happy no matter what. Even when things are going bad. Because I have faith. Faith, family, and then football. Like even when things are bad, I have faith. God knew who I was before. He even made me. And he knew the plans. He already knew the struggles. So I can get past any of these struggles. I have faith in that. I believe in that. And I believe that any struggle that you're going through, that you can get through it too. No matter what you're going through. And use football to spend time with your family, to create memories. Don't let football use you. And may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you. Till we meet again. Football Talk.
Russell Wayne. God bless.